Hello, and welcome to Do Dancing Clips. This is a Blender 3.3 tutorial for creating a stone path. The features of this are it allows for self-intersection. Matter of fact, it allows for any shape. You could create a circle and just draw a circle and create a circle of stones. The individual stones have a flattened appearance and are embedded in the ground. Uh, this, I want to create the appearance of a path that's been walked on for a long time, maybe 100 years. There are controls for how wide to make the path, obviously, and also the amount of variation. So uh, if you want a very regular, very cobblestone appearance, then you can get that. As a matter of fact, you can turn it back to a grid. I don't think I'll use this very much. I, I prefer the uh, more rugged look. The steps to produce this are pretty easy. First, create some terrain. This is a surface, some noise, and a texture. Then we need some rocks. These are created using the built-in rock generator in Blender. I didn't know that Blender had a built-in rock generator for a long time. Uh, we take special care to make these very low poly because we can be creating thousands of these. Go easy on the detail. Next, we'll draw a spline. This will define where the road goes. Uh, the width of the road is defined separately. Um, and this doesn't have to follow the terrain if you don't want it to. The rocks will wind up on the ground regardless of what uh, shape the spline traces. Inside the generator, we'll create a grid. Uh, the spacing of this grid controls the spacing of the rocks, so we can make the grid uh, more dense if you want a denser spacing of rocks, or broader if you want a broader spacing of rocks. We'll take these splines and we'll widen them out using extrude mesh. This defines the overall width of the path. And now we'll use ray tracing for the first time. This will take all the points in the grid and figure out which are adjacent to the road and delete everything that's not. At this stage, we'll also use instance on points to take the rocks we created earlier and put them on those grid points. We'll also flatten out the rocks and add some randomness. And lastly, we'll use ray tracing again to take the rocks that are flowing the spline and put them down to ground level. Also, we'll fix the rotation of the rocks so that they always face away from the slope. First of all, we'll need to enable a couple of options in the add-ons. Edit Preferences Add-ons. The first will be Node Wrangler. Make sure that's enabled and the add mesh extra objects. Make sure that's turned on too. That's where the rock generator comes from. Now create some geometry nodes for the terrain. All we want is a simple grid. To match what I did earlier, I'm gonna change this to 10 meters and 40 by 40. It gives a nice number of blocks to play with. But you can see 40 times 40 is 1600. 1600 times the number of rocks. Yeah, we're going to trim this grid down somewhat, but it lets you know that you do need to be careful with the number of vertices you put on each rock. Now we'll add some noise. Subtract off a half. The noise goes from, the noise starts between 0 and 1, and we want it to go from minus 0.5 to 0.5, so everything stays centered around the origin. Add a vector math multiply. This does two things. It converts our single value into a vector, which we'll need for set position, and it also changes the scale. Speaking of set position, we have the beginnings. Let's add a shade smooth. Now this is way too crinkly, so let's turn down the scale. And turn up the volume. Yeah, that'll do nicely. Let's give this a meaningful name. Call it terrain. I want a couple of splines that the roads will follow. So seven to get an overhead view. Add a Bezier curve. Select all the points. Go into edit mode. Delete the original points. We want to draw our own. Tab to get back out of edit mode. That'll be fine. And we'll call this path. And now for the stones. Under Mesh, Rock Generator. Click on that arrow to bring up this menu. 
10 rocks seems sufficient to produce enough variety that it's not easy to spot the repetitions. X scale, Y scale is fine. I want to turn up the Z scale to about 1.5. And later on, we're going to shrink it back down. This has the overall effect of creating rocks that are a little bit more pancake-shaped for the stone road. The rocks are rock-shaped and more or less spheres. It's very difficult to stop them from sticking way up above ground level. Then it starts to look more like a pile of rocks rather than a stone road. Lastly, turn the detail way down. This will result in about 100 vertices per stone. That's actually more than I'd want. I think if I was doing a real scene after this step, I'd probably create more rocks in this step and then uh, do some post-processing, uh, decimate them and do some choosing about the exact rocks I wanted to try to get the number of vertices down to like 40 or 50. But this will do for this. And this will do for most purposes. It just depends on how busy your scene is. And because our rocks are so low poly, <clears throat> the rest of this really doesn't matter because it won't change much. And let's add these to a collection. And call this rocks. We need two bits of geometry in our geometry nodes. We need the spline and the terrain. I'm going to choose to base the geometry group on the spline. So let's hide everything. Select the path and do some new geometry nodes. Call this stone path. We will drag the terrain in here to create an object. And this is what we're going to start. I need to get the dimensions of this terrain, whatever the user fed in, because we're going to create the grid over it. A bounding box will do the job nicely. Subtract the minimum from the maximum to get the extents. And this will form the basis of our grid. Add a join geometry so we can see everything. I want the density of these stones to be under user control, so let's take care of that now. I'm going to drag this out into space and select group input. What this does is creates a new input in the group category, which also shows up under the attributes. I'm going to change that to blocks. And I'm going to do the same thing for the Y. And give these some reasonable default values. You'll notice that 1,000 has been put in as a maximum. That's because 1,000 is the maximum for this grid. Set those to 48 to match what I did before, just so things look right to me. Later on, I'm going to want to know the size of each block. So let's go ahead and take care of that now. Divide the total x by the number of blocks, and that gives us the size of each block in the x dimension. We'll create a named attribute for this. That will allow anything that has access to this geometry in the future to pull out this value. And give it this value. We'll do the same thing for the y. One cool thing that you can do is, since everything here is a constant, you can hover over the, and get the exact value. So, point 0.2. I'm going to clean this up a little bit. I'm going to goose this a little bit more. We don't need the faces, so let's get rid of them. We will delete edges and face this. Now it looks like we just nuked everything, but the points are really all we want. I want to make sure all the points are above the terrain so, when we, so we can recast downwards and make sure that none of the terrain is above where we're trying to go so we miss it. So let's move these points up. And we know where the top of the terrain is because we just did a bounding box. We only need the z-coordinate. We'll add a safety factor of 0.1 because floating point numbers, comparisons, don't trust less than or equal. I'm going to turn off the terrain temporarily so we can see what we're doing. Now for the splines. We'll take our... I'm going to rename this while I'm thinking about it. 
could be a little confusing when you come back to this not knowing whether this input geometry is supposed to be the Bezier or the train. First resample. Never know what you're going to be passed, and we don't want this to be too chunky. Use a curve to mesh. And the profile will be a curved line. And we'll make the width of the line under user control. So let's create a control for that. It'd be a float. And we don't want it to be less than zero. So we'll take this new value we created. We'll take this new value we created, run it through some vector math. We want to give the profile curve, the line, some dimension along the x-axis. x for profile curve means perpendicular to the original curve. So we multiply the path width by this, and we give it an x-dimension, and also we remove the y and the z. Do the same thing for the start, except for negative one. Now if we give this some width, lovely. Now we want to figure out which points in the grid are above this path, and we'll do that using ray tracing. So our widened spline will be the target, and the source will be the grid. Minus one means we'll be going down along the z-axis, which is right. We'll stick with interpolated. And we're going to delete everything that is not hit. Not is it. And this will be used to drive a delete geometry. And there we go. This is such a cool trick. So now we have the points in a plane that determined where we want our stones to go. And as you can see, this is very gritty, so this is not what we want in the end. But it also shows the promise. So now you can see that this is how we take care of intersections. It's just, it doesn't matter whether the point and the path was hit once or twice, or doesn't matter how many times, we'll put a stone there. This is also the point where you could say, well, instead of a rectangular grid, maybe I want a hex grid, or I want something more random. Whatever the points look like coming in will determine the possible stone locations. The other thing that can make a huge difference in the random appearance of this path is to delete just a few blocks. So let's do that now. Do a delete geometry. We want to do this probabilistically. And you can see it doesn't take much to have a profound effect. So I think point three is where I'm going to leave this for now. And I want to put this under user control. Drag this out to group input to give it a new name. Call it missing rocks. The other thing I want to do is add some noise uh, to break up the grid a little bit. We'll do this with the set position based on noise. Subtract a half to bring this back to noise that's centered on the origin. And I want to scale this and I want the user to be able to control the scale. We only need to move it in the X and Y. So what I'll do is I'll create one value and duplicate it for X and Y leaving the Z alone. And we'll call this new value block variance. And again, it doesn't take much. So the more you turn this up, the more randomness will appear in the grid, but also the more likelihood stones will overlap. Depending on what the effect you want, that could be a problem or that could be a desired benefit. It's the reason we put this under user control. This is supposed to be a stone path, so let's bring in some stones. These come in with an instance on points. And we'll use this rock collection we created earlier. Such a handy feature. And these will be our instances. Nice. Now the first thing we want to do is separate the children and pick one at a time so we don't get every rock on every point. And I'm going to temporarily scale this down just so we can see what's going on. Cool. So this tells us a few things. One, we will do some scaling on these rocks, to, as I said earlier, to flatten them out, to make them more look like pavers. Um, this is also a strong argument where if you're really picky about how your scene looks, like you're going to do close-up render, you probably want to, for one, have more rocks than 10, and two, do some pre-modeling to get just the effect you want for the surface of the path. But what this engine is designed for primarily is 
to do a lot of paths quickly, not one super deluxe path slowly. Let's put some proper scale on these blocks. going to accomplish this with the scale instances. And I said before that we were the, the size of each grid point was going to come into handy. This is exactly where that happens. Go for a named attribute. One for block size X. Shift D, duplicate. And another for block size Y. Combine these. I'm going to allow the user to control the strength of this effect. So vector mass scale and scale. So we'll add two controls to this. One, we want to be able to independently to scale the height of the rock. Call that scale height. And call that scale xy. And now, this is where we get the add the flatness to the rocks, to which to me is crucial. There's, there's two things we could do. We could hide most of the rock below the soil surface, or we can create a really flat rock and lay it into the soil surface a bit. I like flattening out the rock. It also tends to uh, take any like wild uh, distortions at the top of the rock and smooth them out. There's one subtle thing I want to take care of while we're here. The origin of these rocks was chosen by the rock generator, and I don't know what it is. I do know that it's near the center of some rocks, but it's near the bottom of others and near the top of others. This will be a noticeable effect when we're trying to make everything stick an equal distance above the ground. So let's even these out. I need access to the vertices of each rock, so I'm going to realize them. And set position will change their place. This is going to be position based. Now, I want to move each rock as a unit, but we've split it into independent vertices. So I want to give each block an attribute that will mark it as which block it belongs to. We'll do that with a store named attribute as an integer onto the instance domain. We will be storing the index, and I'll call this instance. So what this will do is every instance will get this value which is stupid because it already has it, but after we realize them, every vertex that came from a particular instance will also have that number, and we can use that. Now this is a mathematical trick that I learned a while ago. If you take all the vertices in an object and just add them up as a sum, and then divide it by the total number of vertices, what you have left is the center of the object in X, Y, and Z. So this will sum all the vertices. This will just count the vertices. And there we have our number. But we want to do this once per stone. We don't want to do it for the whole mesh. And the way we separate out each stones is with that instance attribute we just created. Fetch it with a named attribute for both of these. Now we want to use this value we calculated to push the origin of each block, or push the center of each block, to z equals zero. So we will change z from positive to negative. And at the same time, we will zero out x and y because we don't care about them. And that does it. So now all the blocks are sitting at z equals zero, which will become in handy later. And the center of each block is at zero, rather than wherever the block generator decided the origin needed to be. If you were going to generate your own blocks by hand, You'll probably have to change this a little bit, uh, depending on how you decided to handle the origin of your blocks. Now let's add a raycast to move the rocks to the terrain. This is where our terrain will come into it. Did I put three R's in there? By gum, I did. This will be the target. We only want to do an instance on points for the things that are will be hit with this raycast. So let's look this up. In our example, because the curves are not going beyond the edge of the terrain, then this probably won't deselect anything. But if the uh, splines are going near or over the edge of the terrain, this will remove the blocks that overhang the edge. This also has the 
side effect of producing the source for the raycast. So the target we know is the terrain. The source will actually be what we put into instance on points, which is that flat plane of gridded points that we created a while back. Now we also know the hip position, but I want to use it after we realize the instances. So we need to save it. Save it with a star named attribute. And we'll deal with it over here. So we'll get that value. Position. And it also remembers that it's a vector. I love that. We only want the Z component. So what you could do is separate XYZ, connect the Z to a combined XYZ, and stick that into here. But you save one node with a multiply. There we have our path. And if everything is going right, the path is sitting nicely on our terrain. Absolutely love to see that. One thing we could do now is fix the orientation of the rocks so they match the slope. We'll use an align Euler to vector to get the proper rotation. And this effect is very subtle. Uh, it, when you start turning on light sources and adding materials to this is when the failure to do this starts to show up. Let's throw in a couple of textures for that extra dose of realism. So we'll do a set material for the rocks, and we'll also do one for the forest ground. I'm going to bring up my asset browser to get a couple of materials. Shift F1 a couple of times. I'm going to use a forest texture from Polyhaven because it's free. It will be linked in the video description. And I'm going to use my stone texture. Stone goes here. Forest goes here. I'm going to switch the render engine over to cycles because I'm more familiar with it. If you're under this, it looks like garbage. Now, there's a couple different reasons. The forest looks like garbage because it doesn't have a UV map. So let's give it one. We'll give a UV unwrap. It's always a happy day when I get to use store named attribute. This will put the UV field into the geometry where the shader will be able to see it. This needs to be vectors. We'll call it UV ground. And it only works if it's in the face corner domain. Now we need to go to the material and actually pick up this UV map. First, we'll switch over to the forest ground texture. And we'll pull in the UV map by summoning it with an attribute node. Again, we called it UV ground. Like to see that. Now there's a couple of different ways we could fix the blocks. We could UV unwrap each one of them, put in some clever code to find a seam. Wouldn't be too bad, but there's a much easier fix. Let's get this down material, and we'll just switch it from the UV map that does not exist to the generated UV map, which does. And I am pretty darn happy with the results. Maybe just a little bit thicker. Yeah, much better. If you enjoyed this video, check out the link for another approach to road building. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it.